Hey everyone, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, and I want to welcome you to episode 27 of Lemon Thing Live, where the patients get to interview the guests. And today we have a very special guest joining us from the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, Lemon Lengthening and Deformity Correction Surgeon, Dr. Taylor Reef. Dr. Reef, it's good to have you back on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so Dr. Reef, the way that we're going to get started here is I'm going to ask question, ask you que questions that were submitted from the patients first, and then we're going to hop into the live chat to answer questions of those who are watching us right now. Sound good? Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Started. All right. So the first question that we have is, with the recall of the precise stride nail, do you offer staged unilateral lengthening with the precise two nail? Like one leg first, you heal, and then you do the other side. Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, I think that is a fine way to do it. Um, you know, I haven't had a lot of takers only because, you know, it does lengthen out the process. Um, if, you're, if you're really trying to get all eight centimeters that the nails stroke can, um, you know, handle, then, you know, you're looking at a three to six month process for each leg. Um, so it just, it turns it into a year long process. And, um, you know, while we don't have a weight bearing nail, which, you know, I'm, I'm hoping will change in the future. Yeah. And I'm hoping, you know, the device companies are able to come up with something again, where we'll be able to, um, use something like that. Um, you know, I think lengthening one leg at a time is a great way to remain more mobile and, um, you know, make the process, you know, despite being longer, a little bit easier. And, you know, I think that's not a bad way to go if you have the time to kind of devote to it. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you're, you're using crutches, but you have one strong leg and, you know, you're certainly not confined to um, like a wheelchair or anything, which can often be the case when you're trying to do it on two precise nails, which mm -hmm. have, you know, pretty restricted weight bearing. 100%. Awesome. Yeah. I know a lot of people are going to be happy to hear that because they're considering that because like you said, no uh, weight bearing now at the moment. Um, the next question is uh, about insurance. And the person was asking, does insurance cover any aspect of stature lengthening at HSS? Complications, physical therapy, medications, so on. Yeah. So that question is um, multifaceted. So I'll kind of answer a couple parts of it, I think. Um, <laughs> You know, in terms of insurance, there's so many different insurances in our country in terms of different plans, you know, even certain insurances have multiple plans within them. So it's really hard to answer for any one plan to give, you know, a, a holistic answer. Um, I think you can kind of break it down into there's going to be, you know, surgical feeds that go to the surgeon, you know, myself. Um, and those you know, may partially get covered by insurance, um, you know, depending on what other diagnoses you might have, um, you, you know, we'll certainly um, be honest in our booking and that if you have some, you know, varus or valgus or something like that, or some other condition, you know, we can put those in, um, which certainly help with the medical coding. And then, you know, there's going to be the hospital aspect of it. And, you know, for the inpatient stay and more like the associated hospital costs, anesthesia costs, those types of things. Um, you know, our hospital is um, in network with most major insurances. So, um, you know, a lot of those costs will get covered as long as the insurance approves the surgery. Okay. And then, you know, there are those costs afterwards, um, you know, with physical therapy and things, but most insurance plans do cover, um, a, you know, a certain number of physical therapy visits uh, throughout the year. So, you know, most patients I've had have had success getting as many as they need. Uh, throughout the lengthening process. Now, you know, if you were to do one side and then the other and you really needed an intensive physical therapy, you know, you might run into limits or something. But um, yeah, those I think would be covered. And, you know, in terms of complications, um, you know, I don't want to be held to this too strongly, but, you know, if something goes wrong outside of the norm, um, you know, certainly from my end, I'm going to kind of cover that myself and not, you know, I'm not trying to gouge patients as part of this and, um, you know, charge you for things that, you know, I think are kind of outside of the normal um, procedural costs, mm -hmm. because, you know, that's, you know, I, you know, I want to, I want to make things right whenever those things do happen. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to make a buck on that. So that's awesome that they're going to love that because uh, they're always worried. Like, you know, if I have a complication, I'm going to be, you know, break, break yeah. the bank. So, very cool. All right. Uh, next question is, um, about costs, we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. So the person was asking, can you give us a breakdown of the costs involved for getting stature lengthening? So 
you mentioned surgical costs. Um, what other costs are involved in it? Obviously, physical therapy is not included, but yeah, can you break it down for us? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that kind of is similar to the last answer. I mean, the, yeah. the biggest two costs are really the surgical fees and then the hospital costs okay. um, that go along with, um, you know, the main part of the surgery, because w included within that hospital cost is going to be, you know, anesthesia, the implants themselves, the inpatient stay, you know, which may only be a couple of days, but, you know, is still, you know, staying in the hospital, you know, is, is not free. And, um, you know, so there is going to be some sort of hospital bill associated with all those things. And then the after costs are, and the, uh, so radiology is another one that you would kind of lump into those um, fees, um, which again, mostly just x-rays, um, you know, and then MRIs or CAT scans as needed for, you know, patients and if they present needing those things. Um, and then again, afterwards is really just the, the therapy and, um, the, you know, again, further radiology costs with x-rays will be, um, billed to the hospital. And then, um, the, I'm trying to think of any other major costs, like office visits for the first 90 days, you know, those are all kind of lumped into the surgical cost. That's true for any surgery. So, um, you know, it's not too bad. I, I think those are the main ones to figure out if you're really planning to have this. And, you know, we have a whole billing department who can help um, answer a lot of these questions. And, you know, certainly the hospital is a huge hospital and has a lot of people who, you know, work through these things. And, um, I think transparent billing is something that, you know, all doctors should be doing for their patients at this point. And I, that was recently signed into law. So I think, uh, uh at least in New York, I, I guess I don't know nationwide, but, you know, I think we want the whole process to be as transparent as possible for patients just so there aren't surprises, you mm -hmm. know, after, after you get started. 100%. Awesome. Okay. Uh, the next question is about a complication that could, that it could occur, and that is about a fat embolism. Could that lead to impaired vision due to vessel blockage of the eye? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we're, fat embolism is going through the venous system, and that venous system is then going to go back to the heart. That heart's going to get pumped through the lungs. Mm -hmm. And that's going to filter out any fat emboli. And that's why when we worry about fat emboli, it's in the pulmonary system and, you know, leading to, and most people who are undergoing stature lengthening have plenty of pulmonary reserve. Mm -hmm. um, that is, it's really something we worry more about in elderly patients who may have, you know, fragile um, lungs from, you know, COVID, for instance, mm -hmm. or, you know, some other, you know, pulmonary fibrosis or, you know, heart disease. And, um, so those fat emboli then aren't going to make it back into the arterial circulation and then get pumped up to the eye. So okay. um, I, I've not heard of that complication. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a case report out there or something that I haven't seen uh, that made this person worry about that. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that would happen in, unless there was some tiny little fat emboli that made it around and then made it up to the eye or something. But, gotcha. yeah, I, I gotcha. don't think that should be on high on your uh, worry worry list. List if you're undergoing <laughs> this. <laughs> cool. Uh, what, well, I guess an, another question would be, what about pulmonary, same thing, uh, pulmonary embolism, or would that be? Yeah, I, I mean, I think anytime we ream the femoral canal, um, yeah. you're going to get microemboli into the lungs. But okay. for, you know, anyone who's, you know, healthy enough to undergo this surgery, that's, that's not something I'm worried about. Okay. Um, the, that's, as orthopedic surgeons, we mainly worry about that when we do hip fractures because, you know, hip fracture happening in people who are older, who might be sicker, who might not be optimized for surgery. And then, you know, creating those pulmonary um, fat emboli may be a problem for them. I gotcha. Very cool. Um, all right. So this next question is kind of interesting because it does relate to the weight bearing capacity of the nails. So the person was asking, I'm wondering why full leg orthesis, uh, orthosis uh, used for patients with paralysis, peripheral paresis, apoplexy aren't an option for patients lengthening with partial weight bearing nails. Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, most of the time, those full leg orthoses are just trying to, you know, manage either instability within the leg or, um, you know, correct for a contracture or something. So they're not actually changing. They're not like anti-gravity, um, you know, so they're still, if you're putting weight on the leg, you're putting weight on the leg and the orthosis is not kind of somehow, you know, relieving you. I mean, it, there is no anti-gravity that I'm aware of. Um, so that's why no matter what you strap on the leg, it's still going, you're still putting force through the nail 
through a femur or a tibia that's broken and growing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, that's, I mean, I wish there was something like that because that would kind <laughs> of resolve the problem we're having right now with these weight bearing nails. But, um, and those full leg orthoses are not, that you talk about expense, like those, you know, when those are being fitted for patients with cerebral palsy or something like that, um, those are really long-term orthotics that can actually get quite pricey um, mm. because you're getting a prosthetist um, involved who might be, you know, custom making those and things. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, there's no, there's no kind of way to get around the fact that you have to actually walk on the legs yeah. and, um, you know, again, I'm always open to new ideas though. So if <laughs> someone has something they want to send me as an idea, please, I'm, I'm all ears. Uh, cause you know, maybe, maybe they're onto something. Right. Right. Very cool. All right. Um, the next question is about what are your, he's asking, what are your thoughts on using a pure external fixator, like a tailored spatial frame for tibial lengthening to avoid compromising the health of the knee joint, like going through the knee with the uh, nail? Sure. Um, I think, I think that's a tried and true way of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think for standard, you know, more stature lengthening, you know, we usually start with the femurs due to ease and, um, you know, running into a, it's easier to get more length. B, you know, you have usually have a little bit easier time keeping the joint supple. Uh, you're only dealing with one bone, whereas once you're in the tibia, you always have the fibula to manage at the same time. And uh, you certainly can do it. I, you know, I love uh, hexapod frames, you know, still part of the armamentarium that we use. And um, so the, the tibia can certainly grow and you can certainly do it. Um, you know, and it does. Yeah, I mean, I think some people do kind of have chronic pain when a nail goes through the knee joint. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, you know, many patients don't. But yeah, if you, if you really kind of want to preserve the native knee joint, I think, you know, and you're willing to have the wires and pins that go along with having an external fixator, there's no, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, oh, nice. it's, it's a, and that, for instance, is a weight bearing construct. So mm -hmm. uh, you can weight bear on a hexapod, you know, it's strong enough to do that. Yeah. And I think that's why, um, you know, despite internal lengthening being more comfortable for the patient, not having an X-fix and everything, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's nothing wrong. And, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, I, they're certainly still in my, you know, daily practice. Okay, very cool. So you do offer that for lengthening. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I'd say most people don't come seeking it, but right. you know, <laughs> the reasons I've lengthened tibias, you know, for limb length discrepancies and mm -hmm. other um, times you might be fusing the knee at the same time for a traumatic mm -hmm. issue that you then need to lengthen the tibia a little bit. So yeah, there's a variety of reasons why uh, you would still want to lengthen the tibia using a frame. Um, or if you're de correcting a deformity and you need a little length at the same time, you know, you're, you can lengthen it that way. So yeah, fixators, fixators I think are great. And I don't, I don't think they're going away. Okay, awesome. All right, so the next person is asking, when you do your in-person in -person consultation with patients, how do you know if someone's flexible enough uh, to undergo lengthening? Like, um, and also, what type of criteria do they need to pass, such as, a, do they have to do like a psych eval um, to be taken on as a patient of yours? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll start with the flexibility one. The, you know, if someone has a stiff joint, like let's say you're lengthening the femur and their hip or their knee is stiff um, before you even start lengthening, that's going to become a problem almost immediately uh, just because lengthening is it's tough on the joints. You know, you're asking all the muscles, you know, the thigh or the leg to to lengthen along with you. And, you know, if, if the knee joint, for instance, is already contracted, it's going to that's going to become more and more contracted. So really, I think starting with um, flexible joints is, you know, something I would tell anyone getting involved with lengthening would be focus on that first, you know, and then maybe try to do lengthening down the road or find out why the, why is the joint stiff? Why is it um, the way it is? And, you know, kind of attack that first before trying to jump into lengthening because, you know, that's just going to exacerbate those issues. Gotcha. The, um, the psychology part of it, at least uh, here at HSS, myself and my partners, uh, we do, um, screen our patients through a psychologist who we all work with, who, um, you know, it's not a test, there's no tricks. It's just another kind of impartial person that, um, you know, evaluates them through a conversation, just making mm -hmm. sure that, you know, they feel like they have a good understanding of, 
you know, why they're undergoing this lengthening process and what it can and can't do for their lives and just that their expectations, I think, are reasonable. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's not very often that someone gets screened out by that. You know, I think mm-hmm. I have a pretty good sense of people when I meet them. And, um, you know, if I, if I think there's a red flag or something, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to, you know, comment on that as well. Um, but yeah, so that I, but as part of our kind of uh, routine, everyone mm-hmm. just gets sent to this other psychologist just for, um, you know, another set of eyes and another conversation. Um, well, like I said, it, it's not something to worry about and it's not for, you know, to like play games or try to trick someone, you know, it's just, gotcha. it's, <laughs> Just to kind of make sure we're all in this together and for the right reasons. Right. And is that a part of the actual consultation or is it like at a separate meeting or how, when separate is that date, Separate meeting, okay. uh, you know, yeah. this other um, person I'm sure has a busy schedule as well. So, mm-hmm. um, but does offer virtual visits. Oh, okay. um, so um, those can be, you know, she's not examining <laughs> anything <laughs> yeah, that's kind true. of uh, from Check. the comfort of your home. Very cool. Awesome. All right. So um, this next one is kind of, based on a patient that asked a question and it said for a tibia lengthening patient, what type of bone regenerate do you look for to rule out that of a delayed or non-union? Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just ask that part first. And then there's two other parts to that question. Sure. Uh, so the tibia, it's not surprising when it, it behaves a little more sluggish than the femur and when the regenerate is a little less active. Um, you know, I think, Going slower in the tibia is always the name of the game. That's true for most patients that, you know, unless you're a child, uh, you're going to have to go a little bit slower. Uh, so I think, you know, you're evaluating the regenerate as you would any. And if if it looks like it's going to be a sluggish regenerate, that's the time to slow down, but also ask, you know, what are you eating? Are you taking calcium and vitamin D? You know, like, wh- why, why is this? What What's right. going on that, you know, you don't seem to be able to form regenerate well? And, um, you know, I, I just had a patient um, that came from another hospital and, um, you know, had been lengthened an inch and there was no regenerate whatsoever. And I think right. that's like, that's the crime in all this is like, you know, this requires frequent evaluation and, mm-hmm. um, you know, an assessment of is this regenerate what we're looking for? Do I see, you know, those calcifications within the regenerate that show you know, there's aligning collagen strands that are getting, you know, mineralized over time. And, um, you know, so that's, that's really why the follow-up exists and, um, you know, why the conversations exist on, you know, making sure that patients are doing the right thing during this process so that, you know, when the distraction's done, that we don't have to wait forever to um, consolidate. Gotcha. Okay. Now, the second part to that question is about the fibula. Have you ever seen a case where the fibula actually pre-consolidated but the tibia didn't like, you know, um, heal. Yeah. Yeah. I have yeah. seen that. Um, yeah. it was in one of my partner's patients and it was a patient that was not forming great regenerate. Um, I think there was, again, I think there were dietary reasons potentially that that was the case. And the, so, um, lengthening was just very slow. And, um, as a result of the lengthening being so slow in the tibia, the fibula was able to consolidate, no. Um, so what does that mean? It means another trip back to the OR, just break the fibula again, you know, in a relatively small procedure and then continue to lengthen. Okay. So, um, you know, it's, that's, that's uncommon, but yeah, it, it's certainly possible that, you know, again, when you're, when you're kind of managing two bones, that's why, uh, doing this in the femur can be a little bit easier, but, uh, you know, it, yeah, yeah. so it's possible, but unlikely if you're lengthening at a, a you know, even a normal kind of quick. Gotcha. And um, when is it like, let's say that the tibia isn't healing well, when would you say it's time to do some sort of alternative option or method to kind of get some regenerate going like either a bone graft or yeah, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a that's always a tricky question. And um, I think, you know, first doing non invasive things, if you're looking sluggish, um, that can either be um, just simply pausing for, you know, a week or two, seeing if that helps, um, doing like the accordion technique where you, you know, basically kind of compress and distract, Mm -hmm. um, for a period of time, uh, to try to basically stimulate the regenerate a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, if that's not really helping or, you know, those aren't successful in really getting the, um, 
you know, the results you're looking for. Uh, I think doing some sort of bone marrow injection um, from the pelvis, getting bone marrow, um, mm -hmm. you know, that can be mixed with a variety of off the shelf, um, you know, demineralized bone matrix, bone graft products that can then be injected into the regenerate to do kind of like a percutaneous bone grafting. Um, so yeah, that's certainly something that has to be done now and then, you know, ideally that if that's going to be the case, it's happening kind of at the end of distraction on right. uh, the entire regenerate can be uh, treated all at once and has had lots of success. And mm -hmm. then, you know, if that's really not enough either, I think kind of the final step that, you know, it happens occasionally, but it's, again, it's rare is to do like an exchange nailing where okay. you take out the lengthening nail, you ream through the bone again, which, you know, provides a lot of stimulus from the marrow again, and then put in a more solid trauma nail. And gotcha. that will, you know, A, stabilize the bone more, it will provide a stimulus for healing. And usually that's enough to, uh, you know, get the regenerate to consolidate. Gotcha. And then if they wanted to continue lengthening, they would have to get that nail taken out, put back in. Uh, and... Yeah. I mean, if, if that, I mean, usually I'm talking about when someone is like, you know, yeah. you're going to try to get them to their distraction goal. Oh, okay. Prior to doing that. Um, you know, you're going to use those other techniques, the accordion, bone grafting, right. you know, really try to, you know, get them to mm -hmm. um, the end yep. of their goal. And then if things still remain sluggish and things, then you would do the exchange nailing, you know, once gotcha. they're kind of out the length. So awesome. Now you mentioned this earlier um, about like you, you said that uh, you had a patient from another clinic. So you do, do you like if a patient is at another clinic, do you, um, would you review their x-rays to like potentially consult with them from a different clinic? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's, I, sometimes we have to, um, you know, I can say there's definitely been emergency emails, emergency, you know, radiographs that get sent um, yeah. from people who are concerned. So, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to consult with that stuff. And, okay. um, you know, it, unfortunately, I think a lot of people, you know, are out there and they're maybe just trying to make a quick buck by making people, um, you know, taller and but maybe not really focused on the details. And, you know, it's, it's it does require, you know, some attention to principles. Right. And, you know, if those aren't um, followed, then bad things can happen. And um, like I said, you don't want to be left with a large gap in your bone and no no bone growing in because uh, yeah. you've essentially just created then a bone defect. Right. So, um, yeah, no, it definitely, it, we're, you know, it, often it's kind of just a quick review. And then, you know, if yeah. someone really wants a consult, you know, they need to schedule something. Uh, mm -hmm. if they want to have like a longer conversation about, you know, kind of what the plan should be. Right. And, um, but yeah, no, I, I've done surgery on those people, um, you know, because yeah, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't want to let people in, you know, dire straits. We want to, we want to help <laughs> where help is needed. That's awesome. Very cool. All right. And then the final question that was submitted is, is it normal for an external fixator surface level pin site infection to get inflamed or swollen after doing physical therapy exercises? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we kind of in general believe that the pin and wire sites, um, when skin is pistoning on those, um, you know, pins during physical therapy, for instance, that that mm -hmm. shearing effect is something that leads to the inflammation. Uh -huh. And certainly, you know, physical therapy would be able to inflame, you know, those pin and wire sites. And, um, you know, when that warrants you know, starting antibiotics for, you know, a pin tract infection, you know, I think that's a discussion between, you know, how have the pins changed, you know, pictures to your doctor to determine, you know, how they look, um, you know, a, you know, a lot of times a little bit of redness and even a little bit of drainage isn't, you know, it doesn't really require antibiotics, but certainly if it starts to look worse, then yeah, you know, I'm, I'm you know, pretty quick to just say, yeah, let's, let's try, you know, an oral antibiotic so this doesn't progress any further. Gotcha. Very cool. All righty. Well, that is all of the submitted questions. So we're going to hop right into the live chat and um, let's see what sure. we got here. So I'm going to pop the question on screen and we have Kareem. He's asking, hi, Cyborg. Hi, Taylor. <laughs> or Dr. Reef, but yeah, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Just need some clarification. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, just need some clarification that range of motion will be back to normal like pre-surgery in case lengthening the full eight centimeters on the femurs using the stride nail in case realize again okay so i guess they're worried about range of motion getting that back to the pre-op levels yeah yeah i'd say the the vast majority of patients do get back to their normal uh range of motion and okay. that um 
you know, it does require work. I think that's the part of lengthening that people shouldn't underestimate, that it, it does require kind of constant vigilance to mm -hmm. the joint range of motion throughout because, you know, like I said, the muscles, they're trying, but, you know, they're only so long and that means they're going to be pulling on the joints. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, if, if patients are giving it kind of the, the dedicated effort, then yes, we expect joint range of motion to return to normal. Gotcha. All right. This next question here from Benjamin, he's asking, what are some complications you've seen patients have when looking at the x-rays? So I guess, yeah, bone defects and whatnot. Yeah, no, I think, yeah. So the main um, complication is, um, you know, problems with the regenerate, which we've spent mm -hmm. some time talking about, you know, not forming enough. Um, you know, if you, if you start weight bearing too quickly, you can break screw locking screws, um, you know, that, you know, and then the precise nail, for instance, can also break at the telescopic junction. You know, that's all things that we're looking at every time, you know, you get assessed for an x-ray. Um, certainly more major fractures, you know, around the nail are rare if you're abiding by your weight bearing restrictions. Um, you know, I mean, that's kind of what we can see on an x-ray is more of those like bony and implant complications, um, as well as the regenerate. So, um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, and then the joint range of motion is evident just based on, you know, the exam. And that's kind of yeah. why they all go hand in hand every time you get evaluated uh, mm -hmm. to make sure the lengthening is proceeding as you expect. Gotcha. And you do that every, is it biweekly checkups? Yeah, it's usually two weeks. Two weeks. Um, you know, if someone is going really smoothly and it seems like things are kind of like, I don't want to say on autopilot because, like, you know, <laughs> like I said, it does take dedication. But, um, you know, sometimes I'll make it three weeks and, um, you know, if someone's really seems to be on board with, uh, with, with the process. And, I, you know, I'm confident that, you know, they're not going to come in with a joint contracture and <laughs> regenerate that's, you know, not doing well. So, um, but, yeah, I would say every two to three weeks. Two to three weeks. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, he actually had a second question, then I'll skip to somebody else. He says, how long does recovery take? just to go back to activity. So I guess getting back to his physical activity. Yeah, so, you know, go eight centimeters, let's say that takes three months or so, um, you know, maybe sometimes a little bit longer than three months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if your regenerate has been good throughout, then um, the consolidation usually takes another four to six weeks. And then you're kind of back to normal activities at that point when you're weight bearing. Mm -hmm. um, Certainly, I think there's more therapy and conditioning and strengthening that occurs beyond that uh, because, you know, the muscles are now a new length. And I think, you know, people need to kind of continue to work in the gym or at therapy to um, kind of get used to that new length, strengthen, increase their endurance again. So, um, you know, but that's why I, I, you know, if you're certainly going for eight centimeters, uh, those first four to five months. You know, you know, the, between the distraction and then consolidation, um, where you have more limited weight bearing, are kind of when you're not back to activities. But then after that, you're you're kind of you're back to life, but you're still you're still working a little bit. Right, right. You know, that stuff resolved. All right. Um, this person's asking: Is it better to lengthen 0.75 millimeters per day per day to avoid any pain, or is it better to go with the one millimeter per day? Yeah, per day? I mean, one millimeter per day is. Uh, you know, that's kind of just a guideline that is, you know, it's certainly, I think it's just an easy number to remember. And it was in a lot of Elizarov's teachings, um, originally, but I think most lengthenings in adults are going to get slower than that. You're going to be more at that 0 0.8, 0 0.75, maybe even down to 0.6 um, millimeters okay. per day, because there's really nothing to be gained by lengthening too quickly and having bad regenerate. You're just, right. you're just robbing time from yourself in the future when you then have a harder time consolidating the bone. So yeah. I think allowing the bone to really keep up with the distraction and forming good regenerate um, is a good idea. I mean, I've heard also people not having a latency period after the osteotomy and they just start lengthening right away. Yeah. Again, that doesn't really make sense to me because you really, you, that you're allowing the time to set up all those stem cells and things that are gonna grow your bone and skipping that phase just to try to make everything quicker um, yourself you're just you know you're you you might feel good at the start but you know at the end you're gonna you're gonna wish you'd spent that time so um yeah. you know and i think in general some of these things just get at a, a larger issue of if you're gonna undergo this process you know you have to be committed to it and right. you know a week or two here or there um you know you should be able to like endure slight fluctuations in the plan 
um, because it is, you know, people always want, well, when can I get back to this and when can I do this? And it's like, listen, we're dealing with the human body here and we're going to treat you however you need, but I can't map out, you know, a day-to-day -day schedule because, you know, there could be, you know, I don't know how your body is going to behave, you know, compared to everyone else. We have, you know, general understanding and we have a lot of patients who we've seen how they do, but, um, you know, I think you have to be, you know, committed to slight fluctuations, um, and, you know, and discussions with your doctor along the way. I mean, we're, we're kind of here for you the whole time. And, you know, that's why I'm there to decide like, yeah, I think you should do 0.75, but, you know, let's slow it down a little bit. I think, you know, it allows you to work on your emotion a little bit more. It allows the regenerate to catch up, you know, and we're still going to reach the goal. Uh, it just might take, you know, another week or so. Gotcha. That's smart. Yeah. Smart planning ahead of time. All right. Uh, next question from Jeremy. He's asking, do you see limb lengthening becoming or being more affordable in the near future? <laughs> Um, it's a popular question. Not drastically. I mean, I yeah. think, you know, the, you know, the surgical and the hospital costs are going to remain similar. Um, so yeah, I yeah, okay. unfortunately know, <laughs> um, you know those, and healthcare costs in our country, in our country, at least, I'm sure there might be other international people here. Um, right. they certainly tend to kind of trend slowly up. So, um, <laughs> no, I, I think it's going to be, you know, similar. It's, it, you know, there will be differences regionally, like I said, depending on what your insurance is and, you know, what is covered and stuff. And, you know, I think the, the financial aspects of this are complicated and that's where really kind of digging in, you know, and, you know, being assessed. And like I said, we're kind of transparent once you're assessed and we, you know, you know, if you're serious about it, we, we try to make sure, you know, exactly, you know, what you're going to be on the line for and, um, you know, we're certainly more transparent than the insurance companies are, which um, <laughs> they're the ones who try to make things as opaque as possible sometimes. Right. Hiding that fine print. That's what they do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. How do you know if your joints are too stiff for lengthening? I, I mean, you kind of answered answer this a little bit earlier. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I think I think any amount of stiffness is um, a problem. It doesn't mean you can't, it just, then it depends on what your goal are. If, you know, if someone's joint stiff, but we're only trying to lengthen two or three centimeters to correct a leg length discrepancy, you know, right. that might be reasonable. But if you're trying to get eight centimeters and you start with, you know, a stiff knee or a stiff ankle, mm -hmm. like it's not going to, it's going to get worse, not better, even with soft tissue releases, you know, even with trying to lengthen the tendons and things either before or during surgery, you know, mild ones can, you know, like I said, be managed. You can lengthen the gastroc. You can lengthen the hamstrings if you feel like it's really a problem um, when the nails go in initially. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, has, a, a joint stiffness is a, a big problem with lengthening in terms of if you're starting stiff, it's like I said earlier, it's only going to make it worse. So I'm really understanding why it's stiff and if there's anything you can do to make that joint more supple before you undergo this process. It's a good idea. Awesome. Uh, somebody's asking. Yep. And then Randy Armad just gave his Instagram. So you guys, if you see the ticker below, um, I have all Dr. Reef's contact info, and we have our mod here. Just gave he copied and pasted everything for you. So. Yeah. So limb tumor doc is actually probably changing to Reef MD. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't I'll, let you I'll know change. that, Victor. <laughs> all right. so, I'll change that before the end of the show. So yeah, yeah it, no, it's okay. We um, you know, have a new new media person that I'm probably going to be working with, um, okay. and just changing up a little bit. Um, yeah, limb tumor doc, we just decided didn't have quite the ring uh, we were hoping for. But um, yeah, so okay. but for, you can search my name on Instagram, too, and it should come up. So cool. All right, let's see. I don't see Parth's question on here. I think because uh, I'm following some of the lead here. Let me find uh, I'm going to read this one out and I'll try to find it to put on screen. He says, which osteotomy technique do you use and why? Uh, because in some x-rays, there may be bone frag fragments separated from the large bone in the osteotomy area. So I guess they're wondering like the saw versus the osteotome. Yeah. Uh, so most of mine I'm going to do with the percutaneous drill holes and then connect those with um, a sharp osteotome. Um, that's been tried and true, certainly. I mean, and you can do it all percutaneously through um, a small hole. Um, certain other scenarios, I think the jiggly saw is fine. Um, it's a little bit uh, more finicky, and I, I think, you know, in more, most circumstances, you don't need it. Um, I know there's also an intramedullary saw that is used. I don't have any familiarity with that, and, you know, that's not how I 
I was trained and I don't really see a great need to learn how to do it just because having success uh, doing it this way. Um, so, but you know, I know other people have had success with it based on what I've heard at conferences and things. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't think it's wrong, but um, you know, I think the, the percutaneous drill technique is, um, you know, and then connected with osteotomes. And I think one of the questions might be, so sometimes if you do get a slight butterfly fragment or, you know, the osteotomy you make is not perfectly transverse, if you're lengthening, that really doesn't make a difference because as you lengthen, you're still going to form callus and regenerate in that area. And it's going to all connect into one bone at the end of the day anyways. So um, it doesn't, you know, no, no uh, reconstructive surgeon or lengthening surgeon is going to go, you know, 100%, um, you know, transverse uh, throughout their career. So, and just to, the, the times we worry about that is when you're, if you're trying to do a deformity correction and, you know, let's say the osteotomy line, you know, then deflects into one of your blocking screws and, you know, yeah. then you need to put in another screw or something. Um, yeah. That's when you can worry about it. Most of the time, honestly, the lengthening um, we'll correct that. And sometimes, honestly, those patients heal even faster because I think they have a greater surface area to form bones. So right. yeah. um, I think if you're working with a good doctor, they're going to explain all that to you and I'll let you know if that's a problem. Gotcha. I, I actually want to ask you a question on that because I've seen patient um, x-rays they've sent me about, they have like a, you said no surgeon would do a horizontal or a transverse cut. But if they did do a, like a clean horizontal cut, does what what does that do? Is that like does that have detrimental effects? No, no, no. I, yeah, no. I mean, that my technique is mostly like a transverse cut. I'm saying. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're using a drill to kind of all in one uh, gotcha. horizontal plane, and then connecting that with osteotomes. Yeah. So no, I think that's that's great. And when you get it perfect, it's it's totally fine, and um, you know, it's certainly very stable that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just if there are oblique fragments that occur then um, like, like I was saying, most of the time the lengthening will correct for those. And as long as they don't um, impair the stability of the construct, then you're okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, this question from Parth, he's in, uh, found his question and what he was asking, um, he, he's basically wondering, so this is his first part of his question. He's saying uh, the new, because of the poor regenerate with the stride now, um, because it's a, like a really powerful weight bearing now, he's saying, do you think a device that can implement adaptive weight bearing, that can fully weight bear your body weight, but later gradually offload so the bone can get mechanical stress to, you know, form good bone regenerate? That's what he's trying to ask. Yeah, no, I think that, that gets at a really interesting question in terms of bone biology in general. Um, you know, I think part of the reason the stride didn't make as good of regenerate is just because it was so stiff. Right. And when, you know, you have, when the titanium nails are moving a little bit, you're, that's, that's giving the body kind of the sign that it needs to put more bone into that area. You know, that's kind of how callus formation works in general. Mm -hmm. um, and the stride nails, though, were just very stiff. So I do think there's something to be said for um, anything that can modulate the, the biomechanic environment of, um, you know, what you're trying to do with lengthening. So, yeah, I mean, if you can offload it slightly as you have some regenerate, I think that would definitely help. And, you know, I think that, I don't know, that Parth might want to look into like the concept of reverse dynamization. Um, that's a term that often gets used in our field. Um, and that basically states that it's actually nice to have a little bit more play at the beginning. And we think right. of this in terms of internal fixators because you'll create more callus and create right. more, um, the body will try to lay down more immature bone. And then if you lock that down with more stabilization at the end, then it'll actually like be the best environment for all that callus to then solidify, you know, and achieve healing. So sometimes having like really high stability, you know, throughout the process is actually a detriment to healing. Um, so yeah, but this is, this is a question that I think orthopedics has been trying to answer for, you know, since, since the field began is, you know, what is the optimal <laughs> bone healing environment and, you know, and every situation is a little bit different. Right. Right. Absolutely. All right. Um, Randy's asking, I'll find it in the questions, but he says a follow up to the last question about the bone chip, uh, meaning the osteotomy, he said, will this cause any alignment problem or affect the stabilization of the internal nail? So like usually in the femur, no, because it's far enough away from your locking screws that it won't. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. in, in the tibia, for instance, though, it, um, like I said, it, it does kind of that deflect into an area 
um, where you feel like the nail is if it's going to you know impede a certain locking screw from being able to use or a blocking screw that you're using to maintain alignment um, that's something that yeah needs to be corrected kind of at that time gotcha. and um, you know I think that just goes to you have to have a surgeon who understands what every piece of you know what they're doing <laughs> is for and right. um, knowing that if you do have one of those um, butterfly fragments or oblique osteotomies that like is it a problem in this case or is it just going to be fine you know have i um impaired my you know stability or not and that case i was talking about earlier um that i kind of salvaged it definitely did and it was yeah. not you know foreseen by the people who were doing it and it, it ended up being a problem so um <laughs> yeah i think as long as you kind of recognize um, when that stability is affected uh and you you know then you need to mitigate it right then and there yeah gotcha Yep, nip it in the bud. All right. Um, Hamstrings is asking, uh, Randy, I was asking for the price with Dr. Reef. So he was asking that in the last question. So, yeah, if you um, do, you, or do you want them to reach out to you for the cost of stature lengthening? Yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to get into specifics of like the okay. billing just because it is so different for um, each patient. And right. um, I think it's a discussion better had, you know, over some, like a personal call than, um, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a forum like this, just cause I don't, I think that information could be easily, you know, <laughs> misconstrued, misconstrued or, you yeah. know, so. <laughs> gotcha. Very cool. All right. I think Parth has another question or oh, maybe this is his other question. Let me see. What is the rationale behind using a narrow drill and weakening the, weakening the bone before using the manual osteotome versus just using the oscillating saw, which can make a cleaner cut. Yeah. So the oscillating saw is going to produce more heat and um, potentially, uh, you know, kill all the osteocytes in that area. So um, the drill, like a, a fresh, sharp drill bit um, yeah. is going to, you know, drill and remove bone as it drills so that right. it's going to create less heat. And then, you know, and then that creates enough um, when you make those holes, and then you can connect them with an osteotome, which is super low energy and creates essentially no heat. Yeah. Um, then you're really maintaining the biology of that area. Whereas um, just a straight, you know, oscillating saw uh, mm -hmm. can definitely, um, you know, anytime you touch it after you do an osteotomy, it's hot, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's going to cause thermal damage to that area. So that's why, you know, I don't, I don't know many, um, you know, osteotomy surgeons who are going to do that for something like this, where, you know, you're going to need immediate regenerate formation. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you can use, you know, some oscillating saws get used in opening and closing wedge osteotomies, you know, closer mm -hmm. to the knee, you know, I, I don't, those saws, I think have a place, yeah. um, you know, when a drill technique um, may be harder to employ, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, just for, you know, especially in the diaphysis, um, you know, I, I just think those clean cuts are, are probably not a good idea because, you know, so much of the, the, I, the nice part too about the osteotome drill technique is you actually get more of a jagged surface, which actually mm -hmm. has a little bit more surface area, which is beneficial versus if yeah. you're just making a clean cut, you know, then you only have very limited surface area for the, you know, the, the osteocytes to be. And if you yeah. just burn through all those, then it's like you, you might, you know, you might have um, taken away one of your um, uh, avenues towards healing, even though you will, you know, the, the osteotomy should get some recruitment Mm -hmm. um of cells to that area um during the latency phase but yeah. um you know i think some of this is historical and uh i'm sure people try that it doesn't work very well and that's why yeah. you know not people aren't doing it because you definitely want something a little bit lower energy that's exactly the question that i that i was trying to ask earlier about like the clean cut like i didn't you know but that's what i've seen those x-rays that people have sent me it's like clean cut and then you know distracted gap and no real good regenerate so that's yeah. probably what happened is what you just yeah. explained yeah okay it's, uh, wow Incredible. it's not something that i i mean i <laughs> i'm sure it's been done and it's been successful in the past but it's more like when you want a technique that's going to get you to your highest rate of success you know when you're doing things you know a hundred times you know you want 98 of them to be you know successful and if the saw is only going to make it 65 well okay yeah. sure you can probably show an example where it worked but you know then you you've kind of um you know hamstrung yourself you know 30 percent <laughs> of the time so um i think that's what it kind of comes down to that's super helpful wow i okay and then if they had that condition would that be considered 
delayed union? Would things happen or would it be a non-union at that point? Would would you? you yeah, I mean, it just depends on how the regenerate form. Oh, okay. And, gotcha. you know, then okay. kind of go back to that same other question yeah. of uh, the right. things you'd have to do to kind of, um, you know, make that make that better. So, I mean, yeah. in some cases, you know, if the lengthening has been done poorly, it, and you don't see much regenerate, it means you need to go back to square one, compress it back to essentially the bone surfaces being connected, and then mm -hmm. pull it back out again to try to get the process to, you know, the work the way it was intended. Gotcha. Okay. All right, guys, we're going to take about three more questions. And then uh, it's been a long day for Dr. Reeves, so we're going to let him go. But let's um, see here. I think we have Okay, here it is. Parth, has, Parth you're asking all the technical Parth. questions. I know he's on top. Maybe you yeah. should take him in as an intern. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, another question that perplexed me while watching surgical videos: What happens to the bone dust or powder that comes off the drilled bone? Does it get left behind in the body? Uh, most of it, it it remains in the flutes of the drill. So when like when you're doing the multiple drill tech technique or drill hole technique, for instance. Um, I have to clean the flutes, you know, with almost every pass because, you know, there'll be bone left behind and I want to make sure every time I do a pass that, you know, that those flutes are clean so that they can, um, you know, grab onto that bone that's being removed. And, um, you know, that's part of like, the, like I explained, the sharpness of the drill and right. being able to remove that bone is what um, decreases the amount of heat that's generated. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. And then we have one from hamstrings again. These guys are asking good questions. If you do unilateral lengthening twice instead of bilateral once, how much does it reduce the chances of pulmonary embolism and fat embolism? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, it would. I mean, it's it certainly would be about half as much fat embolism uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, you're only doing one of the legs. And then by the time you come back and do the other leg, it's going to be, you know, months later and you know not a you know the, the lungs it's really that's and pulmonary embolism and for fat embolism is a very acute you know problem that passes almost immediately so oh. um you know within the same surgical period if you're doing both legs at the same time i could see how there may be enough fat burden that remains in the lungs to potentially amplify uh the effect of the second leg so it, it would have an effect but again that is for bilateral cases in younger, healthier people. Like I think, um, you know, and having a conversation with your anesthesiologist, you know, hey, I'm doing the second side. I'm gonna have to ream the bone again. You know, make sure the patient's well hydrated. Is there any problem with their saturations? Does everything look, you know, okay from your end? You know, I think is uh, is a smart thing to do. Yeah, very cool, awesome. All right, and we're gonna take this last question here. Um, from Ahmet, he's asking why valgus why is valgus deformity why does that in why does valgus deformity occur in the internal tibia lengthening cases and how do you prevent this complication if it does happen can the alignment be corrected yeah so valgus deformity occurs because the musculature is predominantly lateral mm. so the anterior compartment and the lateral compartments of the leg um, act as tethers um, as you're trying to lengthen and that just I guess it's hard to show this with my hands, but that kicks the <laughs> extremity into valgus. Um, how you prevent this is, um, you know, if you have a fixator, it doesn't really matter. You're going to just put in a new program, mm -hmm. you know, and correct the valgus that way. If you're doing with a nail, I think that's where, um, you know, the use of locking screws is key to make sure that, you know, you're basically preventing the bone fragments, um, particularly the proximal fragment from falling into valgus as you're lengthening because you know it's going to have a tendency to do so. Right. So okay. That's why I think almost all of these cases are going to get a blocking screw um, to manage that. To prevent that deviation. Very cool. Awesome. All right, guys, that is uh, Dr. Reef. So, um, Dr. Reef, do you want to say anything to everybody watching right now if they're considering, you know, stature lengthening, limb discrepancy correction, uh, deformity correction with you? Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I think I've just said it before that, you know, I think as long as you're uh, dedicated to the process, it can be um, a great and life changing um, event. And, you know, it's bone is a, an amazing thing that is able to regenerate. And, you know, I still, I, you know, I still love seeing a bone lengthening and seeing that regenerate form just because I think it is one of the body's uh, coolest capabilities. Um, so, yeah, and happy to evaluate people. Um, the phone number for my office is uh, right there. My secretary, yep. uh, Jeff, is a, a wonderful and very friendly guy. 
um, and is full of knowledge on some of the um, questions people might have. And um, yeah, and I look forward to potentially meeting some people who uh, met me here. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, show your love in uh, the chat for Dr. Reef. There we go, Randy saying that. Um, we have Parth. <laughs> Parth loves you. All right, guys, that is Dr. Taylor Reef from the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. If you want to reach out to him, he has all his contact information here under the ticker, but I also have it posted below this video, and you can reach out to him, like he said, friendly guy, and he'll you know consult with you. So, Dr. Reef, thanks so much for your time. We'll have you on again. All right, thank you, guys. All right.